welcome to the CNBC Africa highlight special of the World Economic Forum's 2023 meetings in Davos, Switzerland. My name is uh, Pippi Peters. And I'm Godfrey Mutiswa. I can tell you, you can see the snow swelling a little bit around us, but I can tell you that the conversations that were taking place in the hall behind us have been anything but. And they have been under the umbrella of cooperation in a fragmented world. Just looking at uh, some of the world's pressing challenges from the climate crisis to the cost of living crisis and world leaders and business leaders have been trying to grapple at how to solve for this crisis within the fragmentations that we are seeing around the world. And over the next 30 minutes we're going to bring you some of the conversations that have taken place all around us here in the official halls as well as outside in the hotel rooms and uh, the cafes where uh, as Fifi said more than 2,700 uh, CEOs as well as business and government leaders have been meeting and talking. Really the sessions have uh, been so many that as you know we can't attend them all. So I've been watching a number of online and, uh, and then arranging various meetings, some with South African corporates, with internationals and with the WEF organizers themselves. Our aim is to rise the metro, to bring the story of the city more to the forefront. And that's really, I think, central to this cooperation, the theme for WEF, cooperation in a fragmented world. That cooperation at a city level, bringing our business leaders, government leaders and stakeholders together at the metropolitan city level to address these risks. Yeah. So we're very excited to have heard a lot of uh, in, um, opportunities for Africa. Yeah. And today at the sessions, a couple of city-based sessions, which I'm very excited about. Talk to me about that. Talk to me about some of the key themes that were developed there. The opportunities for the African continent are quite similar to the city of Durban where I'm from. Agri opportunities, energy development opportunities, education opportunities. And so it's through rising the, uh, the, the partnerships between our local business leaders, yeah. between our policy makers, and international investors or international DFIs that want to come yeah. uh, and capitalize on the inherent endowments that whether it's the city of Durban has or the African continent has. Yeah. Largest remaining arable land, incredible solar resources and wind resources, a population of 1.3 billion on a continental sense, yeah. 60 million in a South African sense, 13 million in a KwaZulu-Natal sense. So the FMCG opportunities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. While I was here in Davos, I was marveling about how they are able to bring number one all these top level executives and leaders from around the world and then secondly uh, the kind of Im impact that uh, these visitors bring and I was thinking about the analogy with that uh, Durban warm um, humid but beautiful and at the same time contrasting it with Davos cold but warm still absolutely the the spectrum of leaders that uh, we've met here in these coming uh, these past few days has been exciting to me um, we sit in this fragmented world and a part of that is polarization mm -hmm. and I think if we want cooperation we need to try and build the middle and do that with a more diverse set of leadership and more diverse set of conversations taking place. So I was excited when Oliver Stone is proudly talking about nuclear. I was interested when uh, the CEO of Palantir, Alex, was talking about using big data, data analytics and smart data applications for defense. Um, opportunities. So these are somewhat controversial topics, yeah. but I think it's important for the WEF and for the world yeah. that we don't live in a monoculture. We don't just listen to one line of the story. And that's what some of the leaders have been doing here today, and it's quite encouraging to me because that will build our cooperation. You asked what the dialogue at Davos is about. It's exactly that. Global warming, climate change, it's 1A and 1B is uh, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Two is the economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are the concerns. And uh, just uh, in terms of those concerns and how they pertain uh, to your business in the health space, what, is, what does it mean for you? Well, I would say that uh, the environment issues are not an issue today, mm. but I will tell you a personal story. I just went skiing and here in Europe, mm -hmm. and the place I went skiing has had snow five years ago, six years ago, and seven years ago. Not recently, they've had it, but sure. high up, 11,000 feet, and there's a problem with snow. 
I think that might explain the whole story. Sure. No, and it also explains some of the reports that we have seen coming out of the World Economic Forum citing uh, the climate crisis, uh, mitigation and adaptation as some of the top risks facing the, the global economy in the next decade. I mean, yes. when you hear stuff like that, so what, it what does that me. make? Yeah. It really scares me. But in terms of strategizing and thinking of how you push through it? Yeah, well, of course, most people in healthcare understand the issue, and we are working on areas such as supply chain, manufacturing of products, but I'm just not sure if the world leaders get it. I'm worried. Certainly in the United States, I'm worried. There are people that get it, but I'm not sure if we're going to be able to move fast enough. It's scary. It doesn't impact my business so much today, although these hurricanes and uh, floods you know, have local impact, but it's not impacting our industry today per se. You mentioned Ukraine then as well yeah. as another risk, and uh, how, how are you feeling about the Ukraine situation? Um, of course it's a risk to global stability, but you'd, I think you'd asked earlier on uh, w what's happening, mm -hmm. and I will say practically in every meeting that deals with geopolitical issues, Ukraine is at the top. I just uh, attended a luncheon where you know, the CEO of JP Morgan, CEO of Goldman were there, uh, the Ukrainian delegation, the Canadian vice uh, uh, prime minister, deputy prime minister, and a whole bunch of other people, m many dealing with the economy. This was the top issue that they were focused on. I, I was surprised more than uh, the climate, but this was the issue. And uh, you know, there's a realignment in the world order. We came as actually recipients of the Crystal Award, which we were so honored and so humbled to achieve. Um, you know, an award of, uh, that's regarding the work that we do in the impact space, because for us it's so important, but a lot of that work has to do around the agricultural sector. So really, when we see the issues um, or uh, the things that we champion get applauded, we feel so great because we've been talking about these things for so long and we're coming to Davos with the same message about the importance of smallholder farmers, the importance of looking at agriculture in a way that is actually uh, a solution towards the fight against climate and um, you know working with people so that people aren't forgotten in the climate um, conversation and, and it's usually rural people who are the most affected. And why is it so important for you to use your celebrity to impact uh, social change? I think, you know, for me, if I'm, if I'm honest personally, my mother was a really strong advocate for, for change in, in, in many different forms. I mean, she worked providing water for rural people. She came from a rural community. She always told us the importance of having land that you can depend on because it's an asset for people who are in rural communities. And she said to us very early on in our lives, you have to give back. Make sure you do something to give back. So I think that's something I've always tried to take with me on, on my journey, on my life journey, and to try and, you know, make her proud in some sense. But the, the education I've received through the amazing organizations, I mean, I've had a master class over the last three years yeah. on yeah. what uh, food systems are and, and how these issues are actually important to us and should be important to all of us. And that's really given me the energy to be more involved as a global citizen, because I think we should all be. And to stay quiet feels like I'm relinquishing some type of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And when you have a platform, you do have a responsibility to make sure that there are issues that you're passionate about um, are known to everyone, right? So I feel quite proud now to have been able to speak up on a platform, to speak up on a platform as big as WEFs, um, to advocate to the people we do, um, because I feel the issues are being heard. And it's never to speak for the people that we're supporting, it's always to speak with. It's about access, it's about getting voices into a room that can't get into that room. We're heading into a short break, but don't go anywhere. More of those key conversations of Davos 2023 happening right after this. Welcome back. You're watching a highlight special package of uh, some of the conversations that took place here with uh, people that we met who were discussing the various issues uh, that are confronting the world right now. Uh, of course, our focus here on CNBC Africa was on the voices from the continent. Here's some. We are uh, at a very, very advanced stage with the Association of African Automobile Manufacturers in establishing uh, 
continental value chains for the auto sector. Wow. For example, uh, processing of copper in Zambia, uh, processing of leather in, li in Liberia. Yeah. Uh, these are value chains that will contribute to the assembly that is taking place uh, maybe in Kenya yeah. or in Morocco or in South Africa. Uh, we know that the opportunities for countries uh, is not, it's not actually on the assembly line. Yeah. Uh, it, it is in the components right. uh, manufacturing in sector. In making that product. That's where for every unit of investment that you have on the assembly line, four jobs are created in the component sector. Sure. So if we are talking about trade that is inclusive and the benefits being inclusive amongst African countries, yeah. we've got to focus on components as a multiplier of opportunities. Yeah. So with Triple AM uh, and the ministers of trade and various governments, yeah. uh, Rwanda, for example, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, have expressed interest to be part of this continental value chain. Yeah. Um, we also have a, a commitment from Africsin Bank, a facility of a billion dollars to support automotive sector industrialization in the AFCFTA market. Sure. This enables us to not just talk, yeah. but yeah. for a country to say we have a genuine interest in the auto sector, but we don't yeah. have the capital. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Africsin Bank has stepped up yep. uh, to, to provide that support. The second example I would make is, is uh, in pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. uh, Rwanda, South Africa, Senegal, Ghana uh, have established a value chain for uh, the pro uh, vaccine manufacturing and production. Uh, uh, not just in one country, but yeah. a value chain that will across spread the, those four countries. across these countries. President Kagame invited us uh, last year in July uh, when he was, uh, um, uh, and these heads of states were doing the, the breaking of the ground ceremony to mark the establishment of that manufacturing uh, plant. And uh, the company that is, uh, a German company that is investing there, yeah. uh, committed that in less than a year, uh, production will be happening in these countries. Yeah. This will not be... Um, possible if we don't have a legal anchor in the form of the AFCFTA. That's true. Uh, to liberalize the barriers that existed before, Yeah. to liberalize the tariff and the non-tariff barriers that existed before. Yeah, I'm getting excited and I'm actually seeing the Airbus being made in this region and that region Absolutely. and that region and I'm going to driving a car called Made in Africa. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Cannot yes. wait for that. I always uh, have a question when I talk to CEOs, when I talk to uh, heads of uh, regional trade organizations and I ask the question, are we there yet? Are we beginning to see the fruits of the AFCFTA? You are here, you watch everything. Mm -hmm. Where are we? The last time you and I spoke, you, you, you said the next time we meet, I will ask you this question. And here we are. And that was about uh, six months And thank you for making the ago. commitment. When you and I spoke, last six months or so ago, there was no trade happening. Uh, we, we had constructed the rules, right. the legal foundation, but the trade was not happening. Now the trade is happening. Um, we have uh, piloted an, an initiative which we call the Guided Trade Initiative, where we identified countries, products uh, that were ready for export under the preferences of the AFCFTA. Right. For example, President Ruto and I, in October last year, uh, saw off uh, containers and containers of uh, value-added agricultural products, tea, that Kenya was exporting to Ghana. Wow. Uh, uh, certificates of origin were issued. Uh, similarly, Zambia exporting uh, under AFCFTA rules, uh, Ghana exporting um, uh, ceramic tiles to uh, to the Cameroon sure. under the rules of the AFCFTA and with the evidence actually that the company for example yeah. the importing company in Cameroon received a duty reduction of 20 percent wow that means that you are 20 percent more competitive yeah. uh, than than before the AFCFTA came yeah. into being yeah of yeah. course, we have to scale this. 100%. Uh, we have to scale it and make sure that it happens from region to region. But what is, it, what is, what is uh, the proof of concept 
a very compelling proof of concept yeah. about uh, that initiative is the fact that the trade that happened was taking place between regions, right. not in regions. Right, not Southern Africa alone, not, not Eastern Southern Africa, Africa alone. But it was ECOWAS EAC, sure. East African Community ECOWAS. It was the North African countries into uh, 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 Central or West African countries Fantastic. or East African countries. So we have begun to trade. Uh, the certificates of origin are issued. The rules of origin are clear. The declarations of origin are also clear. All of those legal instruments are there. And we are now, we have begun a process of tracking yeah. uh, the, the, the flow of trade. Yeah, so uh, you can talk about the volumes and the values. So and we can be able things. to talk about the percentage yeah. um, of intra-Africa trade and yeah. we can make an assessment. Yeah, which I want to talk about because I want to know what the target is now for you now that we've begun actually trading and goods are moving between the regions. Well. Our target is to double intra-Africa trade by the year uh, 2035, um, which actually is entirely within reach. And because a lot of trade happens uh, informally yes. without being captured. Yes, um, by bridge. Uh, that, that's right. Namanga. Uh, uh, Kasumbalesa. Um, uh, you, you name every major... Uh, uh, border crossing, yeah. uh, 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 semi between uh, Nigeria and uh, um, uh, and uh, Benin, uh, a flow between Togo and Ghana. Sure. Uh, so we need to have a, a, a customs regime, a digital customs regime that will capture the trade and that will enable us to 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 make an assessment um, of the volumes as time goes by. Yeah. Fantastic work, fantastic work, Mr. Secretary General. I wanted to uh, finally talk a little bit uh, about uh, the steps that remain to scale up the work that has started coming in. Well, first, as I mentioned, the, the pilot project of trade, uh, the goods that were traded last year and the countries that were in the pilot, we want to increase that number. We have already had very, very positive feedback uh, I was in Tokyo in December. Uh, the Japanese private sector, the Chamber of Commerce said, our companies in Africa want to be part of the guided trade initiative. Yesterday we met with a few uh, global manufacturers who said, we have a production in Nigeria, we are exporting to Kenya, we want to be part of uh, the preferences. So we have to raise awareness and the yes. more awareness we raise, about the, the benefits of this agreement, yeah. the more we are seeing companies, global companies, yeah. uh, global African companies, uh, coming to us and saying, uh, we want to see um, the benefits uh, to our, ourselves uh, as a company. Yeah. So that's the first major immediate priority. The second, of course, is to continue to build, uh, on, uh, to build the, the confidence of Africans that actually yeah. this is possible. This thing is working. That it's working. And if you look at what we did with the Pan-African Pan Payments and Settlement System, yes. with that Professor the Orama, yes. yes, Africa's Bank, um, again, it's a demonstration that it works because if you can trade, if you are in Egypt, yeah. and you can trade using the Egyptian pound with somebody in Zambia, yeah. uh, you, you, you pay your counterparty in Zambia using the Egyptian pound. Your counterparty receives a Zambian kwacha. Ah, fantastic. This is a, a, a tool of trade yeah. that um, we believe will enable us to double intra-Africa trade. So we will build on that. Uh, there is a massive challenge that we have to confront, and that is the cost of trade finance. Right. Uh, and so we are in discussions with our development finance institutions, with commercial banks, uh, in Africa yeah. to see how we can reduce the cost of uh, trade finance, the accessibility to trade finance, yes. and of course the ease of availability of trade finance. Uh, so we have, we have a lot of work ahead of us, yeah. but in less than five years uh, we've done quite a lot yeah. uh, to position the continent uh, for industrial development, for competitiveness, yeah. and importantly for job creation. Um, very important aspect in our lives, as you know, I mean, as a 
fossil fuel company. That's one area we really focus on, me yeah. and my team here. Yeah. And also judging as to where is everybody at right now, especially post-COVID. Mm -hmm. How have different companies and countries advanced in really getting closer to net zero? And it was very clear that there are many issues that have impacted the pace which we have seen pre-2019, for instance. Yeah. Um, issues of COVID where people were not working, um, you know, all programs, you know, that were targeted towards climate change mitigation, those were kind of slowed down. But now we do see that the pace is picking up once again. Right. Now, the other aspect that I believe is uh, also, I would say, really creating some challenges around the pace is this energy crisis that we see yes. with the Ukraine and the Russia uh, problem. And that sort of, you know, uh, challenges the speed at which, you know, some countries could really get to that net zero. Yes. We know what's going on in the Germany um, yeah. environment in terms of them reusing mm -hmm. fossil fuels, that yeah. causing a lot of challenges. Yeah. However, you know, there is a school of thought which I belong to that these challenges we experience, even in our own country, of energy shortages, yeah. should be fast-tracking our speed at which we get towards that net zero position that we're looking at by 2050. Yeah. Coming to the just transition that you're talking about, I had sat in various interesting conversation where, you know, the global north and the global south yeah. clearly still need to align in as far as what does just transition mean for the global south yes because the global south and there were ministers sitting in those meetings and also you know i'm talking ministers of finance right. included in there uh, whose view is that you know there are unique um issues in the south that are different from the north that's right um, one of the critical issues is of resources that we all know that we do have the wind, lots of sun, yeah. um, but we don't have the money to speed up some of the technologies that will take us there. Yeah. And the cost of capital uh, for the South, because that cost of risk, isn't it, mm -hmm. is so high that the speed at which we will be able to achieve these goals will also be impacted. Yeah. So the issue of resources, making sure that technology is made available for us to deal with the issues that we need to deal with, yeah. uh, making sure that the capital is also made available without the restrictions that we see. Yeah. Because oftentimes some of these funds and grants have got a lot that countries must deal with. So mm -hmm. there's a lot between the global north mm -hmm. and the global south that I believe we need to engage in because we need each other yeah. for us to get to that net zero position. Otherwise, the transition is not just. Yeah, so we need to find each other. Absolutely. Okay. You spoke about uh, the energy crisis that we have in South Africa. Obviously, the government has been trying. I think uh, we have all seen uh, the president uh, counseling to come here and also uh, uh, consulting and trying to find solutions. But from a business perspective, could there be more that the private sector could do to say to government, this is something that has seized us for quite a long time and is damaging to the country's image. We need to do a little more. Could you? Absolutely. I mean, from our Minerals Council point of view, where I belong at least, which yes. is the mining industry, Yes. Um, we are very fortunate that we've been engaging our SOEs before problems hit. Hmm. So we are really integrating our views, our solutions within the decision-making structures of ESCOM. Sure. I mean, the outgoing CEO of ESCOM under the rate has been part of our sessions, our meetings as the board yeah. of the MCSA. So um, we are very fortunate in that regard. But let's talk about the practical side of what businesses can do. Yes. Let's just use Exaro as an example. We are very fortunate to sit on a two-pronged solution for ESCOM. So ESCOM is required to continuously, I would say, sustain the capacity they have today yes. from their coal fleet. I'm talking about power stations. Yes. We are in a best position to make sure that ESCOM receives 
the, the call that they require and mm. the right quality specification. Yes. So that's something that we can do. But there's something else which is unique that we have as well as an industry or as Xara. Yeah. We've got a capacity to self-generate um, power in our own operations to alleviate the pressure from the grid. Yeah. And we do that from a position of strength as Xara because we are a renewable energy generating country, yeah. I mean a yeah. company. That brings us to the end of this a highlight special from the World Economic Forum in Davos. And we're certainly hoping that uh, you enjoyed some of the conversations uh, that we were able to get with key African leaders as well as uh, business leaders uh, from across the continent. And we certainly hope uh, you'll be able to join us next year here from the mountains in Switzerland. From myself, Fifi Peters and... Godfrey Mutiva. Yes, goodbye for now. Bye for now.